Uh, so Jim, uh, when did you first notice that there was something that might be a little bit inappropriate going on? Is this something that you stumbled onto or is it something that you were looking for? Well, I guess my mic's on, is it? You hear me all right? No. no. Volume on. Can you hear it now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, when I went uh, from uh, General Dynamics Fort Worth, where I'd been uh, starting up the F-16 program, uh, I went up there because the chairman of the board, Dave Lewis, uh, wanted me to and wanted me to. Uh, the theory was that in six or eight months, then I would take over Valley Otis's job, who was run an electric boat, the, the nuclear submarine business of General Dynamics. Uh, so I went up there uh, officially in charge of engineering. It's a big engineering department, uh, 4,000 folks in it, but in fact, really to get ready to take over the, the whole place. And so I started uh, busily trying to do that. And uh, soon after I got there, uh, Valiotis asked me to uh, prepare a sort of a memo or a report on, the, uh, on some of the problems that they had experienced. Um, what's referred to in the tape as the welding problem. Um, early in 1980, uh, they were about to send some 688 attack submarines out to sea trials when the uh, Navy a little old lady from the Navy doing final inspections discovered there were some welds that were documented as completed and inspected. And when she did the inspection, they clearly hadn't been inspected. And with some more pulling on the string, they discovered there were not only not inspected welds, there were a lot of missing welds. And that led to a, a major effort to tear apart submarines and find out since if you don't know whether you've got a good system in place, it's very expensive to go re-inspect, and especially when you've completed stuff on top of it. So they had incurred very large costs just as I'm coming up there. This I got up there in October of, 80, of 1980. And they had uh, incurred um, um, at least tens of millions of dollars of costs on this so-called weld problem. And they were going to uh, try to figure out how to charge the Navy for it. And so Valley Otis asked me to prepare a report on this uh, with the intent to put a good story together for the Navy. And as he said, uh, you'll be perfect because you're new here and you have a good image from the F-16 program. And so you're the perfect person to put together an, you know, an unbiased report. So. So I dug in to understand the welding problem and, and uh, I got there in mid-October by just before Christmas, I, I had figured out what had really gone on with the welding problem pretty much and that the so, their, their plan was to submit so-called insurance claim, which to argue that the Navy, which insures against calamities in the shipyard was in fact an insurer and therefore since there was a calamity in the shipyard of missing welds, the Navy should pay for it. And I wrote basically a, a, a report to Valley Otis laying out the lack of logic in that uh, for a variety of reasons, both the way the insurance worked as well as all logic in the world, the management failure to inspect and to let your systems go down is hardly a calamity caused by the Navy that should be covered. And so I wrote it down in, in what I would call um, uh, fairly uh, antiseptic terms, why there's no way that claim makes any sense as an insurance claim and that it's really um, clearly the management's fault. That was just before Christmas. And at that point, um, I went from having a, um, if not a warm reception at, at Electric Boat, at least a reasonable reception. I'd only been there a couple months. All of a sudden, um, um, I clearly was not very well received by the rest of the management team. Um, Did it never cross your mind that uh, writing a report like this that was not what your boss was expecting might have some consequences for you? Well, 
um, it clearly wasn't the way I would have preferred to write the report um, in that it would have been convenient to have discovered some very strong rationale. I'm a pretty good analyst, as it turns out, and had I been able to find a good, strong reason that really was something the government could and should pay for, I, I would have preferred that, but, but there wasn't any good way. And at that point, I wasn't really aware of how much additional um, things I was going to find, but that, so um, I probably wasn't, I may be a little naive writing the report, although I don't, don't know that I had any choice unless I wanted to create something that wasn't true. However, the next step was, since I was there to be the next general manager, and since I'd found that much out, I, uh, I continued my pursuit of understanding the place and the costs. And uh, uh, they used to come out every two weeks with what we called the Dead Sea Scrolls. That was back where, instead of having a personal computer with all the latest performance data on it, they printed out from the mainframes um, a summary report of the progress on every submarine being built in the yard. And at the time, we had about uh, 15, sub 16 submarines being built in various stages. And by every craft and by everything, every two weeks, they'd come out with the hours spent doing the work, how much budget was supposed to be used to do the work, and the difference between the two, and then project it all the way out to the end of building that submarine, what the estimate complete would be. And we called them Dead Sea Scrolls. It came out in little tiny print on this this vellum that actually would always roll up if you let it go. And most of the management couldn't read the thing, um, didn't understand it, didn't pay much attention to it. But I used that and dove into it and went back and got the last two years worth and discovered that virtually nothing that I had been told about how things were going, nothing that we were telling the Navy about our status made much sense. So the more you looked into it, the worse it got. By, and you'd only been there for a few months. Right. By the end of February, um, although we were telling the Navy that we were, we were going to, actually the, what the chairman of the board had told me was that on the tax submarines after the big settlement some years before that they talked about in the tape, $359 million loss they'd written off, they'd reset the contracts that they were then going to make $100 million going forward. That's what the chairman had told me. That's what Veliotis was saying. My analysis said they would lose $134 million, um, and the Tridents would overrun by a fairly massive amount. They wouldn't lose as much money because of the structure of the contract. And by the end of February, it was clear to me that the public story didn't match reality. I guess the other part of the story is that I became close to the Navy. Uh, not unusual in a big defense contractor, the, the government, the main service, has their own offices and people within the, the plant. So we had a NAV pro there, a Navy program office. And they busily got data and did their own analysis. And I got to know the head guy there and the captain out of Washington. And pretty soon they were sharing with me their analysis. And, uh, and it was pretty clear that their analysis said things weren't anything like our story either. And <clears throat> so at that point, I was kind of on the outs with Veliotis. Story didn't make any sense. But I believe that the, the uh, corporate office, which was in St. Louis, and Dave Lewis, the chairman of the board, um, I had no reason not to believe that he believed what he was saying. Um, after lots of thought, coming back from an airplane, I was still living in Texas and commuting every other week, I, uh, I made a bunch of notes on my analysis, and I decided I should go around Veliotis to his on-paper boss, the president of the company, not Lewis, but a guy named Ali Boileau. So I called Boileau. Uh, who I knew pretty well because he was an airplane guy and, and had been down on the F-16 lots of times, and told 
Mr. Boilo what was really going on and that we were about to have a big layoff because they said we're overrunning budgets so we're gonna lay off a lot of people, but the reason we were uh, we were also getting way behind schedule because we didn't have enough people to do the work because it was too inefficient. I laid that out for Boilo and he, he basically said, Jim, you, you, that can't be true. Nobody would do those dumb things and you must be mistaken. And uh, I remember when I hung up the phone, I thought, well, that didn't work very good. But the next morning he called me back and said, well, you know, there may be something to what you're saying. Um, and they knew, by the way, that I was actually a pretty good analyst on that sort of stuff. So Ollie said, uh, just sit tight. We're going to send in an ins a team from corporate office to look at profitability on the, on the contracts in three weeks. And, uh, and we'll make sure they understand what you're saying. So they came in. Big team, 10 people, including the corporate vice president of contracts and estimating a guy named Bill McCurdy, who I also knew quite well, and the corporate controller. And we met at night in the Groton Motor, I lived in the Groton Motor Inn since I was commuting. Um, and we met by cover of darkness in my, my uh, efficiency apartment. And I took them through the data and how you do the analysis and how it really works. And then they went about their stuff. I, they, I couldn't meet with them in the plant because that would have been the kiss of death for sure. And so they went off and they did their own analysis and then went back to St. Louis and uh, three weeks passes, I have conversations with McCurdy, um, and McCurdy and I agree on kind of what the results are. He was more optimistic. He said they're only going to lose 100 million. But in, in the SEC rules say once you know you have a loss on a fixed price contract, you have to go report it. McCurdy took that analysis and went to the chief financial officer and the chief executive officer, and I, was, and I knew what he was telling them. Meanwhile, Lewis had been meeting with the Navy every few weeks to try to get a settlement. And I knew what the Navy had analysis and, and uh, they knew some of my analysis and they were pretty close to the same. So McCurdy tells the CFO and the CEO and then we sit and wait and we both think that when the second quarter earnings come out in July, they will take a big write off because the law requires them to, and the most credible people in the whole company, uh, McCurdy and, and the controller and the CFO all are saying that, and absolute silence. No write-off. And meanwhile, I'm getting calls every so often from people like one of the executive vice presidents of aerospace saying, Jim, just sit tight, everything will be cool. So I kept sitting tight. In mid-August, I called Dave Lewis, um, the CEO, he called me back at night, um, had a discussion about the same thing. He said, sit tight, everything's going to be okay. Now, he'd been having negotiations with the Navy every few weeks, and, uh, and the speculation was that pretty soon um, Valiotis would go away and, and probably I would yeah. be running. What was your interaction with Valiotis during all this time? Wasn't he actually your he, the line supervisor? Right. He's my boss through so, all of this. So was he talking with you? Was he uh, warm about the report? Was he hostile towards you? Um, well, of course, he, the only report I turned into him was the first one on the insurance stuff. After that, we had some conversations in his office about what was really going on and really going to happen. Um, and he told me to go talk to Joe Barton, the controller. Um, I, I used to, used to be, I can remember the conversations quite well. Uh, Barton had an office here, I had an office there, we shared a secretary. And, and Joe was a pretty bright guy, good numbers guy, and so I'd go in with the Dead Sea Scrolls and sit and have this conversation with him, and he said, I said, uh, Joe, you can't possibly believe the estimate it completes that the reports are given you. And he said, oh yes, let me explain how it works. And he'd take me through the logic that every two weeks we record the hours worked and the budget, and that tells us how much we have overrun or underrun, and then we add the rest of the budget to the end of the submarine, and that's the, the answer. And I said, but Joe, every two weeks you overrun the budget, just like clockwork, and I had it all charted out. 
And so you can't possibly believe you're going to do the rest of the work all on budget. You haven't done any of the work today on budget, you know, for years. So it couldn't, and, and so I did just about like I described, and Joe would say, well, let me take you back and show you how we do this, and he'd repeat the whole conversation. Just hit erase and start over. And after I did that a few times and knew, I said, you know, there was no point in talking to Tacky anymore. There's no point in talking to Joe Barton. They all obviously must have known the same thing. They wanted nothing to do with it. And so I lived in this strange existence, running engineering, sort of on the outs. They had to know I knew exactly what was going on and didn't know what to do with me. And that was in part, you have to remember, is that I was, before getting into this mess, sort of the golden boy. When I went up there, everybody thought I was going to be the next guy to run it, even though when it hadn't been announced. And nobody knew quite what to do. In the tape, Jim, um, Geraldo Rivera identifies Feliotis as the whistleblower. So um, this kind of seems to be out of character for the conversation that you're having with him. Uh, so was, was he a whistleblower? And, had, had you thought about blowing the whistle at that time? How, how did that whole thing work out? Well, um, I, I would say that, that Veliotis was a whistleblower, and I wouldn't use that depiction for me. Let me spin the story a little further. Um, after I talked to Lewis in the middle of August, and, and by the way, I, it may come back later, I had made notes uh, uh, of the conversation I wanted to have with Lewis on American Airlines stationery because I did it on an airplane. And, uh, so I'd had this conversation with Lewis, and he said, sit tight. In September, about a month later, there's a big expose article in the Providence Journal a report, the, the major Providence newspaper. Front pages covered most of the front page, laying out what a mess General Dynamics was in on the submarines and having pretty good numbers in it. Um, the reporter had called me, and I did not talk to him. And I'm convinced he got all his numbers from the Navy, but I, I don't know where he got them, but he must have got them from the Navy. Um, right after that, uh, I'm sure is, you know, some of it was on the tape, that's when Veliotis is saying he's been talking to people and the like. The argument was, I must be talking to the newspapers. But the truth of it is, I knew that the Navy knew. Secretary John Lehman was meeting with Lewis every two weeks I knew the reports the NAV Pro was given to Lehman, and they were right. I knew that Lewis knew the right answer, because I had given it to him. Um, and I sat tight, and lo and behold, in the middle of October, there's suddenly a press conference with Lehman, Secretary Lehman and Lewis, and all the dispute is gone, and GD is OK, and they, they awarded him some more submarines. And uh, three weeks after that, we delivered the the first Trident submarine, six months later than we thought it was going to. And I was supposed to become general manager when we delivered it. And that was on a Saturday. And on Monday night, they called me and said, um, a guy named Tovar is going to be the general manager, and, and uh, you're not. They didn't fire me that night. Um, and there's kind of an interesting story about, uh, about it, because the guy that called me was Warren Sullivan, the head of human resources for the whole corporation. And uh, so he tells me this, and, and then it's, the phone kind of goes silent. Uh, this is at home at night, and it's a Monday. And he, he uh, says, well, uh, what are you going to do tomorrow? And I said, well, I guess I'm going to go to work. You know, I still need a job. And, well, you don't need to do that if you don't want to. Um, and I said, well, I'm not really that worried about it, Warren. but..." You know, it is a little bit ticklish because I have, um, I'm giving the presentation tomorrow night at the Electric Boat Management Club. Electric Boat had a meeting once a month of their so-called management club. It typically would have a couple hundred people come out for dinner and have a speaker. And I was the speaker and we had 500 people signed up to come listen to me. Um, and the phone, I told Warren, so I'm giving the management club presentation tomorrow and that may be awkward. And the phone went silent. It had to be two minutes with nothing happening. They didn't know what to do at that point. The next day, I gave, a, the, I gave the pitch the following night, uh, which happened to be on career strategy, which <laughs> was well thought out. 
and, uh, and then told everybody that I'd be leaving. And, uh, and that was kind of the end of that. So at that point, nobody had been a whistleblower in the public sense, except maybe somebody in the Navy who had given the newspapers all the information. Um, I left after a couple months, uh, didn't I basically just figure out what to go do. Went back to Texas, um, went on with some other things, and Valley Otis, right, when they put Tovar in the job and they, they, they semi-promoted Valley Otis again over international as well as the, sh the uh, shipbuilding businesses. And uh, then in February, GD took a $134 million write-off, exactly the number that it turns out that I kind of guessed at. And uh, a month after that, Veliotis suddenly resigns and flees to Greece, and soon after got indicted for kickbacks up at the Quincy shipyard, um, different thing. So he flees to Greece. He was a Greek citizen as well as a U.S. citizen. And over the next couple of years, GD's freezing some of his assets, and Veliotis is sitting there in Greece starting to tell his story and tell that he's got a lot of bad stuff on General Dynamics. And, and meanwhile, I'm doing other things, except it keeps being in, our, in places like Business Week and Forbes and the like, making news. And, um, I was out in San Diego in the summer of 1983, so two years has passed. No, it must have been, let's get this straight. I'm sorry, it was 84. And, uh, I get a phone call, I don't know how the reporter tracked me down, but it was a reporter for the Washington Post, and he wants to know if I was electric boat then, I was, and he starts telling me that there was a telephone call in October of 81 between Valley Otis and Lewis when they talk about firing Jim Ashton, and did I know about that? And I said, well, no. <laughs> um, what do you have? And I we talked about the story some, and I said, I've still got all my stuff, but not out here in San Diego. So, um, so I told him, call me back when I'm back in Fort Worth, and, and he did. And this time I asked him, well, why would Lewis, he would said he'd spent the day before with Dave Lewis, and that Lewis had agreed they'd had that conversation, and he'd agreed they were talking about firing me. I, so I asked him, why would Lewis agree to that? First of all, it's illegal uh, to do it for the reasons they were talking about firing me. And he said because he's, he wanted to hear the tape recordings. Because it turns out Valley Otis, sitting in Greece, is releasing tape recordings of the conversations he had with the corporate office. And the very first one that uh, Patrick Tyler of the Washington Post decides to write about are the ones about them wanting to fire me so I won't talk to anybody. And it made the front page of the Washington Post actually the whole first page and half the second page, which the principal article is um, how to fire this guy who's going to tell somebody the story. And that's suddenly um, the uh, Congress is interested, the SEC is interested, and eventually 2020 is interested. If I was a whistleblower, it was only kind of after the fact this sort of raises the question. It's pretty clear that you were bothered by all of this right from the day you arrived, that you spent months investigating, finding things that made it look worse every time you did. You raised your hand. You brought this up to the, to the management, expecting something to happen. It didn't happen for months and months. They eventually let you go in a rather dramatic way. And then there are several months go by. Why didn't you go to the uh, press? Well, um thought at the time quite a bit about what, what is the right thing to go do, both from a personal point of view and from an ethical point of view. From a personal point of view, is kind of a slam dunk. I had already done everything I, I could do within the company and within the Navy. Uh, and I finally decided, after quite a bit of thought, that uh, since the newspapers already had correct data, had written an accurate story about it. Since the Navy, all the way up to the Secretary of the Navy, had an accurate story and really knew what was going on, and, and the corporate people, not only my boss, but all the way up to the CEO, had an accurate story of what was going on. 
um, that at that point there wasn't any percentage of seeing if we get another newspaper article written. And uh, I thought, I'm not going to be able to get anything done. Um, I've already got everybody who should have done something about it aware of the real situation, and nobody would do anything about it. And that's when I walked away. Um, in retrospect, I still think that was the right thing to do because I don't believe I could have succeeded in getting anything else done. Now, once it became public again, however, um, for, through, because of Valeolis's other problems, uh, in my view, it was then an opportunity to lay out um, real behavior by the largest at the, the then largest defense contractor in the country in behavior in working with their customer, the Navy. And by the way, even though Lehman tells the story as though he was a good guy, the part of the story is also the acquiescence of the top of the Navy to all of this too. And that at that point it was a story that being out in public and people really understanding what went on could potentially do some good. And, and I, it's a funny way to describe it maybe, but Dave Lewis died a couple years ago. Uh, Veleotis died a couple years before that. And Veleotis died in Greece, still a fugitive of brain cancer. Lewis died a few years ago, and he's from St. Louis, and that's where the headquarters were. And he made the front pages of the St. Louis newspapers with his, and the obit starts with, um, about two paragraphs about all the good things he did in the aerospace business and for general dynamics and slightly into the story of, of his passing. It then talks about him having to retire in shame from the scandal at, at general dynamics. Uh, I, I'm not telling you this in sort of a vindictive way. I believe that Lewis getting skewered, and he finally did, um, caused a lot of other people in other companies to look at that and say, <clears throat> I would not want to be him. And I think that that as a uh, uh, impediment for other people um, doing, going, having behavior that is unethical, in many cases illegal, um, getting caught and getting punished is part of the thing which keeps people from doing it. I never had to go to jail. But he certainly got skewered in public and had to retire in shame, and that, in my view, was a worthwhile thing to help have happen. Looking back on this episode, sort of what lessons did you learn, and what advice would you have for young people starting a career today? Well, a couple things. Um, First of all, if you get caught in a, uh, I always describe it as the great submarine mess, but in a mess, not of your own making, but you're in it. Um, there is a, uh, a lot of people have the inclination to think, I better just keep my head down uh, because if, if, I, if I go do what I kind of think is the right thing, and usually figuring out the right thing, what's right and wrong, isn't the biggest issue, it's what are you going to go do about it. Uh, one of the inclinations is I'll never recover from this. It doesn't take a lot of brilliance. To, uh, maybe the first report I wrote was um, overly naive about just writing down the right stuff for Valley Otis. But after a while, I knew this was not likely to turn out to be a, a good event in my career. Uh, and there's a easy to come to the conclusion, life's going to be over because of this, which is a big thing to keep you from going forward. Now, life wasn't over. Uh, my career had worked out pretty darn nicely afterwards. I, it was a big setback, don't get me wrong. A lot, of, a lot of less than fun things. But, you know, I've had all kinds of interesting jobs after that. Um, if you care about material wealth, certainly have done quite well. Um, lots of interesting jobs and things. Life wasn't over. It did have a diversion in it. So, you know, you can recover just fine. 
However, you ought to understand when you do that in that environment, don't think that you're uh, bulletproof. You're very likely to not um, survive in the narrow sense within most companies if you discover, or most situations, if you discover people are doing things which they know aren't right and you won't go along with it, uh, it's not likely to be uh, that you're going to come out ahead in the narrow sense that somehow you win and you get rid of the bad guys and the good guys all win. The good guys don't always win and they certainly can suffer along in the process. But it's still the thing you ought to go do. Um, the other th thing is uh, maybe a broader observation. It's, I've had a number of messes in my life beyond that one. Um, I always tell people I got fired. I, got, I made the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal for getting fired from two different companies in three month period. Um, almost, I don't think anybody else has succeeded in doing that. Uh, they didn't happen three months apart, but they made the newspapers three months apart. One was General Dynamics, and another was a healthcare company I was president of. Different story, but, but uh, because of doing, because of some illegal things that were going on. Um, I think it's um, easy to uh, um, talk yourself into the fact that, there, you know, basically everybody's a good person. That, that the world is full of good, maybe a few misguided people. Um, I don't believe that that's an accurate description in the history of man. It isn't an accurate description in businesses. I believe most people are honest and they're trying to do the right thing. But evil exists in the world. Uh, criminals exist in the world. Um, and talking to them nice isn't necessarily going to change their mind. And, and so when you happen to find, get thrust into that, you don't want to confuse yourself with, well, this will all work out just fine because these folks don't really mean to do anything wrong. Some people mean to do things quite wrong. And you can be a big influence in the other direction and that's what you ought to go do. But uh, it really is uh, uh, out there some of the time. And you ought to, if you're faced with it, figure out what you can do about it if anything.